What is happening y'all? Cowboy here. Welcome back to another Code Vein build video and today we're going to be taking a look at the walkthrough build. Now when I say walkthrough build I'm referring to not only the build that I used to get through the walkthrough but also a build that is well rounded around being able to tackle all of the content in this game with ease. This is the build I used in producing the 100% walkthrough and I've had a lot of folks asking if I was going to make a build video on it so here we are. Now, jumping on in, we're going to be covering the end game version of the build, in addition to kind of going over the things you're going to want as you work towards that. Uh, as you can see, we are using the Queen Slayer Blood Code. Initially, you can start with whatever you want. Obviously, Fighter is a decent fit, but one of the first things you're going to want to get access to is Atlas. Until you have Atlas, you can, of course, use Berserker, but Atlas is what is going to carry you all the way up to Queen Slayer, which you get in the memory portion, which is halfway through the Cathedral of Blood. Once you get Queen Slayer, there's really no reason to go back. This is an extremely well-balanced code, and most importantly, it's going to give us access to a buff that is going to allow us to pancake pretty much every boss in this game. Moving on from there into our gear. First up, we have the Zweihander Fortified. Now, the reason for this is we have 100 defense across the board in Slash, Crush, and Pierce. And this means anytime you are blocking with the sword, you are negating all physical damage that is incoming at you. This has some obvious synergies with some passives I'm going to discuss, but all in all, it makes it an excellent choice for a first traversal and any traversal through the game being able to shut down damage. Your secondary weapon late game will be the Argent Wolf brand, which when fortified has a hunter defense against Slash and Crush, but until you get access to that, the Queen Slayer Greatsword is a great alternative. Now the reason for this is we want to pick up a weapon that has Crush attack. Uh, going through the two weapons here, if you listen very carefully, you can hear it's a very clang somewhat sounding and you can see a uh, physical slash mark being made, whereas with this, you can hear a crunch type sound that's happening when it connects in addition to seeing a larger spike uh, or spark go off of the dummy there. And that's the crush damage that this is doing. And some enemies in the game are more resistant to slash, while others are more resistant to crush. Uh, this is of course covered in the walkthrough, but the basic gist is hit an enemy with both swords and see which one hits harder. That's the one that you know they're weaker against. But the point here is to have access to two different types of damage, whether it's gonna be slash and pierce or crush and slash. The point is you wanna have two different damage types. And to that extent, the Argent Wolf brand is going to be a great late game alternative. Now taking a look at the Queen Slayer Greatsword, the reason I like this so much is it has very wide sweeps, whereas the Zweihander is going to be more single target focused. You know, we have the second hit is a decent wide sweep, but it, our other two hits are going to be big. Uh, with this sword, our second and our third hit are both wide sweeps, making it an excellent weapon for when you're surrounded. In a similar fashion, the Arjun Wolf brand actually has the same Zweihander moveset, but what's great about this is the heavy attack is a very wide sweep. As you can see, this thing is going almost all the way around us, almost 360 degrees of coverage, and the charged attack on this has a big dash in a hit, which is going to be great because it'll allow you to basically wait while a boss is in its phase shift, rush on up, and give it a big old boop for free damage. Uh, moving on into the Blood Veils, when you first get access to it, the earliest one you'll find is the GXM variant. This is one in uh, one of the early areas of the game. It is a very solid Blood Veil that could actually take you all the way to the end. As you can see, a plus 10 with fortification. I have uh, equal light gift to my current Veil. I have more drain attack, uh, You know, more defense in some areas, more resistance in some areas. You really can't go wrong with the GXM. Now the reason in particular that I would suggest going for a garb, and as a reminder, this is the same thing as the silver garb. Anytime you find a veil, the vendor will offer two different alternative color schemes for you to choose from. Uh, this one in particular has like a black one and a red one. But anyway, moving on, the reason I'd suggest the veil is gonna be the resistances. Uh, and to show a better comparison here, looking at the GXL Defender, another decent choice, you notice we have more defenses all around, but our resistances suffer a bit. And the reason I find resistances more useful with a build like this is we can already shut down almost all the physical damage that's coming our way. In boss fights, we're also going to have quick mobility for dodging, so the only real threat is going to be the lingering effects from resistances, and in particular, inhibit. Inhibit, in my opinion, is the most deadly status in this game. And the reason for that is to start, it's going to remove any buffs that you have active, and on top of that, it's going to lock out all of your casting. So until you remove Inhibit, you won't be able to use any of your abilities, and in a game that so heavily favors ability usage, this is essentially a death sentence. 
if you are inhibited, you can't even uh, do the heal that would raise your teammate back up. That's how detrimental it is. So this will give us relatively high light gift. It gives us excellent inhibit resistance at 127, and we still have decent defense on it. Um, another thing to point out here is this is also going to come down to the type of blood veil you use. If you want a claw, you use the GXM. If you want a stinger, you use the Sanguine Garb. If you want Hounds, you use GXL. And then if you really want Thorns, you can use the GXH Assault. Though I wouldn't really recommend this one. It's the only real strength veil here, but it does suffer a, light, uh, a lot in the Light Gift category. Uh, moving on into our passives. First up, we have Two-Handed Sword Mastery, and this comes from Atlas. This is just a flat damage boost. It's roughly 20% uh, towards the damage you're going to do with Greatsword. So it's kind of a no-brainer auto-include this one. Uh, moving on from there, you're going to want a Fortitude Up. Now, the first one you can get is Mind Vitality from Eos. Later, you can get Mind Fortitude from the Demeter Tree. And the main reason we're using Mind Fortitude here is late game, you have such high HP that increasing our vitality up to B doesn't even affect our health. So Mind Fortitude is going to be a better choice. But the whole point here is you want to have Mind Up because you need your Mind at B plus for a buff we're going to be using. Moving on from there, let's discuss Drain. Now, there's two main Drain passives. We have Weapon Drain Rating Up and we have Guard Drain Rating Up. Weapon Drain Rating essentially is going to increase our Weapon Drain from... Uh, I don't know if I can pull it up on the screen. I can't. Uh, but our Weapon Drain will go up by 0.2, which is going to allow us to pull in more Iker as we're attacking. In a similar fashion, Guard Drain Rating will allow you to pull in more Iker as you're defending. This has obvious synergy with a sword that has 100% block across the board. So you can use whichever one you want. Uh, towards the late game, I would suggest swapping over to Weapon Drain because you'll find yourself attacking a lot more than defending. But early game, Guard Drain is an excellent choice. Uh, in particular, these two abilities, Weapon Drain comes from uh, very early on in the game. You get this from Caster, and then Guard Drain Rating comes from Atlas. As for our other passives, this is where things get a little bit tricky. For all general content, I suggest tirelessness. Now, the reason this is so nice is it's the only thing in the game that's going to increase your stamina regeneration rate. Uh, there are a couple different things that can increase your stamina, but overall increasing your regen rate is something that's relatively rare. And this makes it excellent for just all around usage because you use stamina to dodge, to attack, to a block. Uh, and so this is just going to be really nice. In boss fights, however, I'd suggest switching on over to Swift Destruction. Now, you can swap out whatever you want for Swift Destruction. You can put it in place of your drain if you want to keep tirelessness on. Uh, but Swift Destruction is going to give us a 20% increase to our damage in boss fights, making it a almost mandatory passive to have. Um, but you're, you're, you really have freedom in how you want to use these. The two main things here are you need two-handed sword mastery and you need something that's going to give you mind up. Beyond that point, you want something that you can swap on out for swift destruction. And then it's really a preference whether you want more stamina, you want more drain, you want more drain on block, whatever is going to float your boat there. Uh, just to discuss these, Swift Destruction comes in from the Hephaestus Blood Code, which is rather late game. And in a similar nature, Tirelessness comes in from a side quest in the very last area of the map, so also very late game. So until you gain access to one of these, I'd actually suggest just running Guard Drain Rating and Regular Drain Rating, just so that you have plenty of Iker coming on in. Now moving on over to the skills, let's discuss the two abilities that I have on there. Physical, Tormenting Blast, and Dragon Lunge. Tormenting Blast actually comes from the Atlas Tree, so we're going to have that inherited pretty easily. And then Dragon Lunge comes from the Berserker Tree. Now the reason I decided on these two abilities is all in all I found these the most consistent. Uh, in particular with our Lunge, we have a long distance covered. As you can see, starting from all the way back here, we are still able to go in, slide on up, and hit the target, it tracks, it has excellent reach, it has good AoE, all in all making it a very well-rounded ability. As for Dragon Lunge, this is going to be our Punisher. This is the one we're going to do when we want something dead. It starts off with a big stun, and then a big hit that comes on down. In terms of damage, as you saw, it also did roughly 2,000 damage more than Tormenting Blast. Now, these two abilities are both gained really early in the game, and that's what makes them so attractive, and they will take you all the way to the end and all the way into New Game Plus. There's some other things you could mess with. Uh, I know on the Warrior build, I was using different abilities, but after playing through the entirety of the walkthrough with those two abilities, I just can't go without them now. Uh, they're just... They're so consistent, and that's what I love about them, you know? Anytime the, the target has a slight delay, rush on in, stun, boom, big damage going down. Obviously, you can dodge something, you're surrounded, boom, you're going to wipe out everything that was in front of your sword. Great abilities all around. 
Now moving on from there, this build, as I mentioned, obviously has a lot of gift light scaling. And to that extent, we're gonna work in one spell slot. Now this is going to rotate based on whether you're fighting long range or close range. If you're fighting stuff at long range, you're gonna want to use the spikes. Uh, there's a spike for every element in the game. And I mainly like having spikes to knock off those enemies that you'll see hanging off ledges. A uh, single spike is usually enough to knock them off the ledge. And that's just going to give you a nice long range ability option. Your spikes come from the hunter, the dark knight Hermes, and then lightning spike is from DLC. So if you don't have DLC, you can't get lightning spike, but it's not the end of the world. Um, as for our barrages, these are going to be our close range damage. This is if we need quick on demand damage that is going to come out faster than our greatsword would while still dealing respectable damage. As for those, you get your barrages from Fion, Scout, the Flood of Impurity Depths, and the Void Depths. Um, as I mentioned, you're going to use one as per the situation. If you don't like magic at all, feel free to replace this with another buff, but I didn't want this build to get too buff intensive. Uh, and I do like having access to magic for cases where an enemy is weak, because between your barrages and your spikes, you can cover all four primary elements of the game, ice, fire, lightning, and blood. Moving on into here, this is going to be our rotating buff slot. Now, right now I have adrenaline on, but ideally you'd want this to be a element that something is weak against, whether that's flame weapon, blood weapon, lightning weapon, frost weapon. But if you don't have access to those, adrenaline is still a nice buff. It's not going to be the biggest buff. You get it really early just in the fighter tree. But one of the nicest things about adrenaline is it lasts a really long time. I'm going to put on adrenaline now and keep going through the buffs. And by the time I'm done talking, it'll probably still be up, which is what makes it one of the better buffs, in my opinion. You know, it's less downtime. It's less it's less worrying about keeping a buff up. And it still is a decent damage increase. See, we're now doing 2050 with adrenaline up. Now, moving on to our primary buff, and you're going to get this one from the EOS tree. So it's going to be a little bit later in the game, but it's a bridge to glory. And this is why we need B+, and it's also why we want to have high light damage. With Bridge to Glory on, our damage is going to go up drastically. As you can see, we're at 2446, and this is also going to scale with the amount of light gift that we have. Uh, if I was to put on, say, Noble Silver, for example, as you can see, I'm now doing 2536. So you could even work more damage out of this if you want, but Sanguine Garb is going to give us a respectable amount of light and a respectable amount of drain and defense and resistance across the board. And I felt this was a good balance. You know, we, we're doing we're doing big hits here uh, to swap on up to the, the Zweihander just with these two moves active. As you can see, we're doing 2,500 plus per swing, which is pretty respectable damage and is going to be enough to take on pretty much anything in the game. Um, now, as for our bottom buff, we have Blood Sacrifice. You get this one from the Hunter Tree. And Blood Sacrifice is essentially only there to make buffing before a boss even easier. If you don't like using Blood Sacrifice, by all means, don't. But it just makes things that much easier when we need Iker on demand. If for some reason the boss is transitioning fast a lot and we are not building up Iker off of drains or attacks, that's going to allow us to pull in Iker. To help synergize with that, we're going to be running Cleansing Light, which is coming also in the Queen Slayer Blood Code. Uh, and Cleansing Light, I've, I've found this to be just a fantastic buff all around. Uh, what Cleansing Light is going to do is when it is up, you will heal over time 75% of all the health that you lost. So this makes using Blood Sacrifice cost very little. Uh, in addition to that, if you take a big hit from the boss and you just dodge for a little bit, your health will heal on up. And all in all, it just makes it a very attractive buff for general play. Uh, costing 10 and lasting a pretty good time, it's easy to have this on as you traverse the world. And all in all, that is going to allow you to keep your regenerations that much longer because you're healing up for a lot of the damage that you took. Now, the last and arguably most important piece to this puzzle is going to be Final Journey. This is locked to the Queen Slayer tree. When you pop it, it's going to refill your health to full, and it's going to drastically increase your damage. Uh, just to show what it looks like when we have all of our buffs up, just our three main buffs, we are now swinging for 3785. And this isn't even the highest. There are things you can do to get this swing up to like 5,000. There are already one-shot builds where people are essentially utilizing this combo and doing you know, hits that are in the realm of, of 90,000 damage and one-shotting bosses by stacking buffs. But all in all, just having on Final Journey, Bridge to Glory, and then a buff of your choice, whether it's Adrenaline or an Element, will allow you to do very consistent damage 
maintain quick mobility, and all in all get you through pretty much all the content of the game. Um, Swift Destruction, we're only going to put on after we have Final Destination up, or excuse me, Final Journey up, because we're now at quick mobility, and we get that 20% damage boost, which is putting us up to 4,500 damage on normal attacks. And this is more than enough to tackle all the content in the game. You know, you're at 4,500 damage per attack. You are absolutely smashing any boss that you come up against. Um, and as you can see, the buffs last quite a while. On top of that, Final Journey in particular lasts three minutes. It is important to note that when this buff runs out, if you either don't rest at a missile or you haven't killed a boss, you will die. So that's why I suggest you only use it for a boss and at the same time you swap on the Swift Destruction passive. But it's still such a worthwhile skill to have because having quick mobility and access to two-handed greatswords is really just a lot of fun you know it's it's big beefy hits in a super super uh quick and zippy package which is just a very delicious combination so anyway uh now that i've covered pretty much everything there is to cover uh we're gonna go and fight some bosses in particular um we'll we'll take on the the uh the guy that i do in all the build videos and then i'll go after the the final final boss because everyone was upset that I was fighting Skull King previously and not the final boss of the game. So either way, let's jump on into that. So jumping on into the depths, we're going to go after the Queen's Knight first, as always. I feel like this guy has, uh, he's basically solidified himself as the community's punching bag, even though we have an actual punching bag back at the base. Uh, so before the fight, you would buff on up. Uh, you could put on Frost or whatever element you want here, but we're still going to just stick with the, uh, the Adrenaline just because it's easy to manage. Put that on, it'll heal me to full, and we're gonna jump on it. You'll notice already, even though he hit us, our health, as long as we don't get hit, we're gonna heal the up for that big chunk of health, which is what makes this so nice. And on top of that, the mobility here is really, really useful, you know? We have a lot of mobility. Um, we're, we're very easily able to dodge most attacks, and the attacks that we do get hit by, they're not going to do all that much damage. As you can see, he's already down, wasn't really all that hard, hit us a couple times, and even then, still wasn't much of a challenge. Uh, so up next, we are going after the very final boss of the game, the secret final boss, as you could say. So if you haven't seen this boss, I'd suggest turning away now. In the previous videos, we went after the Skull King, and I called him the final boss, trying to preserve the secret, and that apparently made a lot of people upset, because uh, Skull King's not the real final boss. Even with spoiler warnings, you're just expected to give it all away these days, you know? Anyway, so go on, buff on up. Same thing as before. Same three main buffs. Go on and top our Iker off all the way. And that's the final boss of the game, also down. So, like I said, all in all, this build is designed to just be very, very balanced around tackling all the content of the game. Um, you know, you can deal with fast characters, you can deal with casters, you can pretty much deal with anything that comes your way. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention before we close out is while I recommended the Zweihander because of the defense that it offers, if you really want to peak your damage up, swapping up to the Argent Wolf King's Blade is an excellent upgrade. The heavy attack on this thing is brutal, um, and I do like it more than the Zweihander, but I would be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that this has 100 defense across the board, making it an ideal weapon for a walkthrough. So either way, guys, thanks for coming on by. I hope those of you that watched the walkthrough series enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next time with another Code Vein build video.